Matt Reese is the director of ASN or Australian Sports Nutrition. It supplies sport and health supplements across Australia and the US, as well as sports nutrition advice. So if you're an everyday Aussie wanting to get healthy or you're a professional athlete with pretty specific objectives in mind, ASN's aim is to help you on your health and fitness journey by talking to you about the right supplements for you. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, you only get one choice here, uh, a pre-workout supplement or post-workout supplement. My head says I should say post-workout, but I'm a bit of a stim junkie, so my, my heart says pre-workouts. I'm known to probably have too many pre-workouts over the years and I've become a bit of a stim junkie. So um, it's something that I need to, as I'm getting older, something I need to cut back on a bit. But no, in terms of advice, you need post-workout, you've got to recover from your workouts. He could cheat and do the post-workout and do about 20 coffees beforehand because this stuff is amazing. So it gets you out of bed though. That's right. Yeah. yeah you always, you can become reliant on it, but yeah, if you're getting up and training early, there's there's nothing like a good pre-workout to um, give you that bit of extra energy to to get going over morning. Someone like you, you know, you are an athlete, actually former athlete I say, but I use that word very lightly because you just recently won, what is it, the Dash for Cash in Perth? Is that right? Tell us about that. Oh, mate, I, to, to be honest, it's I, I race in the Masters now, so I don't really class it as a proper win. And any Masters racing, you're doing for enjoyment. So um, I don't, you, you don't like to sort of claim too many wins as a Masters win, but um, – it's just a race week they have in Perth every year and they have a couple of sort of longer races and they have a few shorter races and um, I was lucky enough to stumble over the line in one of the shorter ones and, and have a victory. But but as you say, when you're racing in the 50s category, it's not a proper victory. There's plenty of there's plenty of blokes on the beach that can still give you a flog. Ma- masters or not, no yeah. way. Yeah. Because Except your you, body is still letting you get over the line. I was thinking your first. brain doesn't stop getting yeah. competitive. Yeah. So, yeah, at that starting line, you're always going to be like, I want to win this. Yeah, as I said, you, you're really just doing it for enjoyment now. And, of course, when you when you race, you want to hurt yourself and, 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 and do your best because you've got your – generally, you're there racing with blokes you've been racing against for 30 years and you still like to have bragging rights at the – at the bar afterwards when you're having a beer. So, yeah, it's always good to get a win. How is the body? Oh, mate, I think I'm like most 50-year-olds. It's slowing down. But um, I've sort of never really had a break from training and, and competing. So I, I think that that helps me a lot. I've had sort of a few, a few major injuries that I've never had before over the last sort of year and a bit, which – was a bit of a learning curve for me, but I'm... How old do you feel? To be honest, I mean, you always... I don't know, us males always say in the head we don't think any no, differently to when we're right. 18, Still do we? 20, yeah. But um, oh, I don't know. You know, I still think I'm as... Mobility-wise, I'm probably not as good. Like, I've still got the aches and pains, but in terms of strength and things like that, I still feel as, you know, as strong as what I did in my probably mid-30s. Mid-30s, I think I can sort of, you know, strength-wise in the gym and that sort of thing, I'm probably as strong. The old um, hard, the, the really hard efforts these days, like if you're racing against the young kids over three or four minutes, so that, that's what hurts. And sometimes you sort of think, oh, you know, the heart's racing and you think, is this really healthy, what I'm doing here? Or But, but yeah, I'm still going, I'm still battling away. So, so we uh, we grew up in that era of uh, the Trevor Hendys, the Guy Andrews, those sorts of guys. So who, who was your favourite back then? You would have raced against these guys. Oh, mate, I, I was as I, as I always say to people, I, I was lucky that I came through in the golden era, probably of Ironman racing, yeah. when um, Uncle Toby's were putting a, a lot of money into the sport, and 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 I was just a hacker who was lucky enough to go along for the ride so I yeah I got to know all those blokes pretty well and and racing them all the time and and in saying that you know I don't think it, Trevor Hendy would ever lay awake at night the night before a race worrying if Matt Roos was going to beat him the next day I think I think he knows he had me covered but um they, they were all they were all great blokes and I, I did a lot of training with Guy Andrews he was a he was an animal and um and I've actually speaking to him this weekend up at the Gold Coast so yeah, they're all great guys. We still all see one another at surf carnivals and have a beer and a, and a catch-up, which is one of the beauties of the sport. 
You're right about that golden era. Those names you mentioned were household names, mainly because of Uncle Toby's and the ads and what they were willing to put into it. That's changed a bit over time, has it? Does that make you a bit sad? It, it does make me, yeah, it does make me sad as someone, I mean, I've been doing the sport. I started Nippers when I was three. And so I've been doing the sport since I was three years old at Swansea Belmont Surf Club, you know, dragging along with my older brothers and that when they first started and I was only three. And, and so I've never, I've never really missed a year. But yeah, the, the sport did drop off there for a long time and, and it has dropped off. At the moment, it's sort of, there's a couple of big supporters um, in the sport at the moment. There's, there's a company called Sure and Partners and they've sort of started getting behind Iron Man racing in that again and they're putting on some this summer of surf series they're putting on some really good races and that all the good guys are going to and there's some decent prize money and they're holding it in that's where we were this weekend up at, up on the Gold Coast and there was big surf and, and it was it was my youngest daughter was sort of competing in the youngest age groups but um to watch the the guys in the open races I really enjoyed it it was sort of they were getting pumped it was big and big and scary and they were getting pumped out the back so it was great it was great to sort of have that atmosphere again at the beach. So you got the thrill of, you know, racing. You've, you know, you go through that, that career of, of being an athlete and then you kind of hit that stage where you go, now the athlete becomes, you know, a second choice to maybe professional career. So what was the, the transition, you know, what was that like and then eventually starting ASN? I mean, in terms of the transition, it, it wasn't. You know, it wasn't difficult for me really because, again, I, I would never class myself as an elite athlete and I suppose I always – I just love doing it. I love training. I love the racing. You know, we were travelling around the country and, and getting trips overseas to race and all that sort of thing and I just really wanted to hang on to that and do that for as long as possible. And I was sort of lucky that I lived at home with my parents. They were very supportive and so I almost just treated it I could earn enough money out of it back then where it was almost like a part-time job while I was at uni. So instead of going and working at the pub or like most blokes were doing, I earned enough doing Ironman racing to sort of, it was like I just sort of had a part-time career. So I was always studying. I sort of, I went okay. I went pretty good at school and, and um, I sort of started a, a commerce degree and and I started it full time, but then I realised with the training, I, I thought, oh, geez, I've got to milk this as long as possible. And so I, I dropped back to part time. The training, not the commerce. Yeah, 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 that's right, the training. So, so I dropped back to sort of part time uni, you know, that, which is a massive eight hours a week, <laughs> you know. So, uh, and, uh, and as I said, I was lucky enough that mum and dad supported me. And so I suppose I really dragged out that study side of it for as long as possible. Did so you finish? I, yeah, yeah, I finished. Yeah, yeah. So I I'm kept impressed right. you got to the end. Well, well actually, I, I, what I did was I was worse than that because I finished my commerce degree and then I thought, oh, I've got to keep studying. So I did a CPA and then I did a master's. So <laughs> I've got all these qualifications, but I always say I'm the world's dumbest accountant because <laughs> I've got all these qualifications, but I never really went and worked as an accountant. So, Except but, that would have set you up really well for starting your own business, surely. Yeah, and, and that's what I mean in terms of the transition it made it easy because I never really thought in my head that I'm an athlete. So it, was, it wasn't like you see these guys because a lot of the guys I was racing with and was good mates with, they really did struggle with that transition and you see it all the time with athletes. You know, they really identify themselves as an athlete and that transition to normal life, it, it is a difficult one for them and a lot of them struggle with it. And um, It's really interesting. I'm sensing like you're – it was a hobby that just got in the way of life for a bit there. You still did the study and did all the serious stuff and never saw yourself as that professional athlete, but managed to do really well, but it was just a hobby that got in the way. But m mind you, I suppose in my head, I, I, I enjoyed the, yeah. the study was getting in the way. Yeah. If, if I was good enough, if I was good <laughs> enough, I would have been a full-time athlete. Don't worry about that. But I suppose I was at least smart enough to know that- To do both. You're probably, you're probably <laughs> not going to beat Trevor Hendy, so we need to find a plan B- but in saying yeah. that, that plan B is now probably a superior outcome in hindsight because you, you, you learnt, you know, um, work ethic, you learnt, you know, to be content in where you are, you didn't identify yourself solely as an athlete, so therefore you had a bigger picture view than most. Uh, so, so that was, I mean, ASN eventually started. How, how did it start? Well, my, my, I'm in business with my older brother, Simon, and um, he actually started it part-time 
as a he, he was in the building game. So he was sort of, he worked for an insulation companies for a lot of years as sort of sales manager and, and that sort of thing. And he was, he, he wasn't, he was a pretty good, he was a pretty good salesman in his day. And um, he was right into his bodybuilding type training. Back then it was, you know, all the sort of the, the bodybuilding and he was right into that. And he, and again, you couldn't get supplements in Australia and we used to get our our uncle owned a news agency, so we used to get a lot of the magazines and, you know, you get the muscle mags and, and all those sort of magazines and he was right into those and he started just ordering supplements from the States. And um, and that progressed to where he was getting them and just sort of selling them to mates at the gym. And then after a while he sort of thought, oh, I might open, I might open a shop. And he sort of did that. And again, he opened one on the Gold Coast because he liked going to the Gold Coast partying on the weekend. It was a good excuse to go to the a Gold tax Coast. Dose, that'll help, yeah. Yeah, it was a good excuse to go to the Gold Coast. So we set one up on the Gold Coast and um, he started to open a couple of stores and um, I was actually working for a financial advisor in town who I'd been working for for a while and I was about to buy into that business. And um, Simon sort of said, I'm not real good at the admin sort of bookkeeping side of this business. It was getting a bit, because the business was growing quickly. And he was sort of like, I need to start taking this seriously. So, um, yeah, I went into the business. I went into the business with him, so. Why did it grow so quickly? What 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 changed for gym goers that all of a sudden supplements were an important part? Well, one, I, I, th- I think it was just sort of a, a knowledge, a knowledge thing and sort of a, you know, people just became more aware that these these supplements actually work. You can get these supplements, and they they will actually help me put on muscle or recover from training and and that sort of thing. So I think there was sort of that the the market was becoming more aware of what they you know what was happening. The market in America just was growing, and and I suppose it was just one. Of, yeah, I, I don't really know why it sort of took off in that stage, but I think it was just health and fitness has become a lot more important. I think as a society, even though we're sort of getting, they say we're getting unhealthier, but it seems as though there's, which seems to mean more and more people go, oh, geez, I've got to get healthy. Yeah. And are willing to spend money on it. Yeah, yeah. Because edu- education probably was the key factor. I mean, back in the, I, I remember going through, you know, my footy career and it wasn't around until later on and what you associated with bodybuilding or things like that was almost like, steroids it was bad it was always that sort of stigma around it whereas supplements education came into play which was like hey these are actually healthy products these will help you cut recover these will help you perform but not in the way that people used to think back then and i think it did come down to education didn't it and it did and i suppose that's what we've always prided ourselves on the education side of things and the knowledge of things because you know, where, and, and this is particularly the case with Simon because he's right, he's five years older than me, but he's right, he's still right into his training, still trains bloody two, three times a day and he's, ne- he's never stopped either and he sort of looks, you know, he, he, he's, he's fit. And um, so he basically just wanted products that he wanted to use and that's what he sort of started selling and that's how the business has really developed. It's like, and, and I suppose I've always been the same because I'm into my training we we sell products that we want to take and that's where I suppose we think we're different to a lot of over the years we see a lot of businesses and as we've grown you go to sort of a trade show or you become you know you go out looking for products overseas and you're talking to these blokes about their their fitness products and that sort of thing you're like you're 30 kilo overweight you know it's sort of it's they're really they're just there to make money and they're sort of designing a product based on a price point and how much money can we make out of this product, whereas we've always designed our products on stuff that we want to use. Because, mm. uh, I mean, would you say, bold, bold statement, but I, I probably believe this, that if you were an athlete now and you didn't take supplements versus you did, you, I don't think you could compete. Is that right? I mean... <sighs> Just due to not so much the performance but yeah. more the recovery. Again, when you're talking about elite athletes, when every percent of a percent counts, then you need that. I mean, we always say, we we say, now we're sort of moving into that general health market. For the majority of our customers, they need to start with the foundations of you're eating right and you're doing some exercise. Mm. And and then supplements become, okay, well, how, 
I want to lose that extra couple of kilo. I want to put on that extra couple of kilo of muscle or I'm feeling a bit tired or I can't sleep at night. And so they're always, as I said, they supplement your healthy lifestyle. And so, you know, I, I, I'd be sort of lying to say, oh, the average person has to take supplements and that sort of thing. But for an elite athlete, I mean, things like creatine, which we were talking about before, I mean, it's one of the most researched products, supplements out there and it definitely will help you in your, you know, recovery, sports performance, you know, most sports performance activities. Crazy. And so, um, you know, athletes, the, you know, the NRLs, the AFLs, the, the swimmers, all those sorts of guys, how much do you need to have um, input or, um, you know, help work with those guys closely to, to get the best outcome for them? Because it, it's not a one-stop shop. It's not one, you know, size fits all. What's that process like? Well, I mean, again, it's like anything. It really depends on on their goals. So, you know, you might be working, you know, you might have someone who comes in and they they want to move into the front row in footy. So they, well, their footy coach has said, look, mate, you need to put on a bit of size. So they're trying to bulk up. So obviously there's, there's really, you know, your certain products, you've got to make sure they're having their enough carbs, enough protein, creatine, you know, to just help them put on size. Whereas you might get someone else who's coming in and they might be trying to make a, a weight category for fighting. And, and obviously what you would give them is totally different. Or you might just have, you know, a busy mum coming in and they're feeling a bit, a bit flat mm. for energy and that sort of thing. And, and so you can look at what, how their sleep is, all that sort of stuff. Well, throwing in the mix, you know, elite athlete, then weekend athlete. You know, I remember when we were going through the juniors at the Knights, I was that scared to take a Panadol because a cough syrup was had I think pseudoephedrine in it and that was banned and then another one wasn't and all these little things that you've got to consider it's huge. are there rules around the supplements like I know they're not drugs but are there some things that some people can't take at that elite level oh there's plenty I mean at, at the elite level where they're getting you know drug tested, tested. Yeah, yeah there's stuff you they you can't plenty, sell them yeah there's plenty of stuff but I mean the, the majority the majority of sports supplements in Australia sort of fall within the food guidelines and there's not too many products that, you know, an athlete- Can get you into trouble. Yeah, can get you into trouble. The, the, main, the main risk, I think, for elite athletes is if they're taking hardcore, they're looking for hardcore stimulant products, hardcore test-boosting products that generally come from the US, and it's really if they're getting made in a manufacturing facility that might and you know they might be making other stuff and their their certifications mightn't be right and they and and this is where I do have you know I know you hear athletes get test positive and they say oh it was a tainted supplement and I know most people go ah oh, that's that's rubbish they're they're taking it but I do have some sympathy for those athletes because you know we've met with a lot of manufacturers in the US and over the you know in, in twenty plus years you deal with all types of people over there and, and, and it is possible that, you know, when they're making their products, they're not thinking about a, a swimmer or a football player in Australia that could potentially get in trouble and for some of them it's career ending. And that's where I, I see the big point of difference with ASN because you've always been somebody that's, you know, researched massively, you know, constant education to, for yourself so then to educate the market and that has been why you've been an industry leader. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think that's one. Over the years, you know, we talked about initially we were really just targeted at that bodybuilding market and obviously they're at the more extreme end of people's body goals really. And and, I, and that's probably one of the big transitions in the whole industry is as it's gone more mainstream, you have to adjust your, your offering and your products for, for those people. And obviously, you know, if a, a mum comes in and a 16-year-old son or daughter's swimming training five mornings a week, and they just say, oh, they're just hungry all the time. Obviously, they want to know that what they're giving them is safe and there's nothing in it that's going to hurt them. And that's, you know, obviously we pride ourselves on either sourcing quality products like that fit that goal or, or we get them made. Hmm. And so it's a, it's a tough market you operate in because it wasn't originally around, you know, and then you are an industry leader. And then there's a lot of people that, you know, sort of a uh, um, copycat, if you like, and you see them coming to the market, they think, I don't even need a shop front, I don't need a research, and they can see, because I'm assuming there's healthy margins in product, but when you do it well, 
that margin gets smaller because it's education, it's shop fronts, it's people, it's constant research. How do, how do you combat that? And how do you always hold a good brand and good market share compared to those people? I mean, it, it, it is difficult. And the, as you said, the market has become very competitive. You know, when you've sort of, you've got sort of supermarkets, pharmacy, all those types of businesses selling supplements these days, and they are obviously all, all cut, cut into your business. I mean, the thing we've always tried to do is be in charge of our own destiny. And so when we, when we originally opened up, you know, we were like any business and we were just sort of buying products off suppliers and the suppliers sort of tried to push you around a bit and, you know, not give you products sometimes or, you know, they'd impose certain rules on you and that sort of thing. So we went and thought, well, let's go and source our own products. If we, well, Let's go and find the products that, that we want to sell, that we know the market wants, that we're using. And so we started back in the early days, going to America. We'd go to the big trade shows in America and we started importing products ourselves. Um, and we also said, well, let's, let's manufacture our own products. We want products that have got, you know, ingredient X, Y and Z in them because that's what we want to use. So Simon went and found a manufacturer and we started making our own products. And again, that sort of helped us stay ahead of the game. But then I suppose everyone thinks, let's start making our own products too. <laughs> And so they started making their own products. And then we, we started to have issues where the manufacturer, you're relying on them to put as quality ingredients in them as what you want. And so we started to have some issues where our product quality wasn't the same. And, you know, you sort of start to go, what is, why does that taste different the last time? Or why is the colour off? Or why, you know? And so we started our own manufacturing facility. So we went in partners. There's a, there's a brand called um, International Protein and they were one of the big providers in the market. They've, they've, they're still going strong and they've got a very good brand. And they were having the same issues with their manufacturer. They sort of said, we're just not getting reliable manufacturing. And um, one of them was a food scientist and the other one had run manufacturing facilities. And they sort of said, well, let's, let's team up with your business and our business, we think we'll be able to sort of start a manufacturing facility. And we sort of thought, oh yeah, that's great. You know, at least we know exactly where the raw materials are coming from. We know exactly what's going in our products. And I think we started that in a small shed at Ormo on the Gold Coast in sort of 2009. And now we've, um, now we've sort of got a 3000 square meter facility. And, um, you know, I think, I think it's blends. I think we blend a, about 120 tonne of sports supplements a month sometime. Oh, sorry, about 10, sorry, about 10. Now, what is it up to? It's up about, I think it does about 10 tonne a month of, of sports supplements. Or if, if and we're talking like powder, so that's a lot. Yeah, and, that, and that's getting sent to, you know, now we sort of send products to India, China, Asia. So it's sort of, an, but we know what's in the products, which is the, the main reason we did it. And, but that side of the business has really taken off. And well, and all of that gives you an edge and you've obviously evolved and changed with the times and the technologies and things like that. Why still have stores? You've got 30 something of them. Is it still important that you have a presence in shopping centres, et cetera? Yeah, we've always, we always believe that the, you know, bricks and mortar retail is a tough gig these days. It's very Because competitive. of the overheads. Yeah, your yep. costs are high. It's very competitive. But we also feel that that does give you credibility. You know, it does sort of... Do you have enough credibility after 21 years to just go online now? The customer base is there. They know who you are. You've got the marketing and brand behind you. I think in, in our industry and, the, and because of our business model where, you know, we want to educate people, people still want to come in and talk to you. Of course. And if, you're, if you've got store managers that are educated, people get excited about their training. They want to, you know, come in. And if you've got sort of store managers that can – listen to them, they can tell you that, you know, I'm having this problem or look at the, you know, look at the gains I've made and the store manager can sort of work with them and say, well, give this a try or maybe don't try that or try this training. We, we just find that the, you know, things like the body scans, you know, they can come in, they can get a body scan done, see what their body fat is, all that sort of stuff. We've just found that the, um, the bricks and mortar we furl is an important part to our business. Obviously now we're not opening as many stores as we used to and while we're sort of looking for um 
locations all the time, probably the whole COVID situation made us become a bit more choosier with where we open. Did any close? We did. We closed some over COVID. I mean, we, we kept the majority of them open and I mean, COVID was tough and, and sales took a hit. We kept the majority of them open and, and, and to be honest, without the job seeker support, we would have struggled to keep a lot of them open. Because you talked about the, the value chain really, which is streamlining distribution or um, operating further down the chain in manufacturing your own product. So you pick up a little bit of margin there, you pick up control, which is really good. Um, however, how, did that, how was that affected during COVID? Because supply was an issue, but as the manufacturer, did that help or did that hinder? Oh, it, I mean, it definitely helped us having those sort of strings you could you could pull if you know in in terms of because as you say when supply is limited if you're sort of to an extent got part of that supply chain you can obviously prioritize where you need it to go over over other you know other areas of the business so it, it does give you that bit more flexibility because you, you you would have been torn between we want the supply versus we need to still look after people who we supply to. Is that right? And that, that constant battle of, you know, self-value versus a longer game with, with other people you deal with. Yeah, and, and that, that is probably the challenge of our business now because as, as you're, you're not just a retailer, you're wearing a number of different hats and you've got to, and especially if you've got partners in those businesses, you've got to put on your different hat when you're making a decision. And as you say, if I've got my retailer hat on, I'm obviously saying, well, we want all that stock, we need it. But if I've got my manufacturer's hat on, it's like, well, geez, they're a good customer of our manufacturing business and they need stock as well. So we've got to, you know, you've got to juggle those relationships and, and, I, and I suppose it's just a matter of coming up with, communicating with people and coming up with solutions that suit mm. everybody. And so additionally to that, you talk about the value chain. Another big thing is, is marketing for businesses. You could have the best product, but if no one knows about it, it doesn't exist. So, so marketing for you guys, I see that, you know, obviously we talked about buildings, really important. And how important has been, you know, further education, independent articles versus social media versus influencer marketing? What's been the big sort of uh, marketing area that has provided the greatest gain for you? Good question. I mean, f for us, because sometimes it's difficult to know the answer. And I think that's the challenge for a lot of business with marketing is what's actually working for us. And I know- That thing you spend a lot of money on that transactionally, sometimes you can't tell. Yeah. And that's an area where I suppose m myself personally, and especially as we've gone into this more modern social media and, and all that sort of stuff, which I'm not good at. And I always say, one of my strong points is I, I'm- I know that I'm no good at it. So I'm, I, we always say I'm, I'm consciously incompetent. So I know I'm hopeless, which I think is better than being <laughs> ignorant to the fact yeah, that you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but, but the marketing has always been a struggle and in, in terms of where's your best bang for buck. And I suppose the benefit we've had is the fact that we've been around for 20 odd years, we've got a really good organic, we've got a really good organic community and that's, I suppose, the solid foundation of our business. And, and typically when we look at our, our um, e-commerce performance and that sort of thing, it is fundamentally that organic side of the business which is dominating. And, and so for us, it's constantly trying to go into new areas and go, well, okay, you know, what return are we going to get on that? But, but as you know, sometimes it's a real challenge to know what return you are actually getting you knew to adopt and embrace social media pretty early get people tagging you and yeah. showing your products off even if you, it, you didn't have control over it but you had customers that were keen to tell you tell people where they bought it things like that yeah well again personally i'm not great at that but in the early days simon was really good at that and he would just you know even pre sort of when the facebook algorithms were basically if you didn't spend money you didn't get anything and he would simon would just spend hours and hours sort of going through and linking up with personal trainers and oh you know you're looking great where do you get your subs from and you know might be able to look after you and, and sort of just basically using it networking and that's how the work that sort of him and his wife did with that in the early days it did grow that organic base and um and i suppose now we're trying to look at other areas outside the the digital and, and as i said we're always looking with our service offering in terms of 
you know, things like the body scanners in all the stores. We've sort of, we've got a, an, an app, like a fitness app that we use that people can get their diet plans and, and all that sort of stuff. We've, we were one of the probably, we got into the body challenges pretty early and we, in the early days, we were sort of running those body challenges, which were really successful for us. We were sort of getting thousands of people sign up to those and you'd sort of run that 12 week challenge after Christmas and we had some great success with things like that. But like anything, everyone else starts doing it and it becomes a bit of a mosh pit. And then, it, and then you've got to sit back and say, well, okay, what's the next thing? And, um, and sometimes, so, so you true. Yeah, sometimes you try next things and they're a dud and you've got to learn from it. And or some, you try other things and then people copy them as well because they're so good. Well, Ro- yeah. Roman Brady was on, you know, on the podcast and he talked about it, it's a community. You know, people want to belong. You know, yes, they want to go to the gym or yes, they want to buy supplements, but they want to feel like they belong to something and they want to, you know, work together and have that, you know, sort of motivation as well because, you know, motivation doesn't last long for many people. So that's that's a, 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 a handy thing for you to have is those challenges and, and feeling part of a community. And like you said, that's been your greatest advantage or your greatest asset in your marketing, yeah? Yeah, it, it has. And that's what we've always sort of focused on, that real community, that community feel and, and getting back to the, you talk about the bricks and mortar stores. And, and if, if you're store managers or franchise owner is good at that they can build a real community around that store and it it does in an industry where there's not many barriers to entry that community can give you a bit of a a barrier to entry in the 21 years of asn was COVID the biggest challenge biggest battle or have there been others oh we've had you know it's like any business person it, it feels like that you know, you can sort of feel like there's always a challenge. And I think any business is challenges every day. I mean, COVID was the biggest, for me personally, the biggest eye opener in terms of, you know, we need to think about some of these decisions we're making. We're not invincible. Yeah, yeah. Like in the early days, we could just open up a store and it didn't matter what the rent deal was. <laughs> where You know, it was like, we'll, we'll be right. Let's just let's just open them. Yep, sign the deal. Let's get it done. Let's get the store open and the store would, would pump. But but as we said, as the markets become – and we were destination stores and people – it was not unusual, you know, people would drive an hour to your store. But – now you can get supplements at the supermarket, you can buy them direct online, you can get them, you know, at every pharmacy. And so convenience became more of a factor. And that's where, so you, we'd always stayed away from shopping centres. And then so we thought a lot, well, we've got to get into, we've got to start putting our product in front of the customer. You know, as you know, you've got to, you've got to be where the customers are. And um, so we started getting into some shopping centres. Despite the high rent. Yeah. And, and as I said, COVID... When COVID hit, you were like, "We're still paying this rent. <laughs> we're exposed here. You yeah. know, this this is this this is a pretty yeah. big exposure. No customers and high rent. Yeah, yeah. And, and we had a few sleepless nights there. But but as I said, you just you do what you got to do. We were sort of lucky in some cases. We had some sort of understanding landlords, and in, in other cases, we had to, as I said, take your medicine, <laughs> take your medicine, take a hit, and decide. Okay, we've got to get over the ego of shutting that store because obviously as a business owner you don't want to think I've got to admit defeat there I've got to shut that that store and and fight another day but um in a number of cases we shut some stores and in hindsight they were probably stores that you'd probably pick the wrong location or sign the wrong deal anyway so COVID probably just rushed that decision but but we're sort of back now to post you know, back to what we were before COVID and, and, you know, as I said, opening up some new stores and and obviously now that's led to the next challenge, which has been price rises. And sort of <laughs> like every industry at the moment, we've been getting, you know, some in some cases protein prices have gone up 60% and you're sort of like the price rises come through and they're coming through from we're getting them in manufacturing. We're sort of seeing what's coming through in our raw material purchases. And um, you're sort of like, well, how are we going to deal with this? Because you can't pass that on. Not 100% of it. To the customer. You just have like, to wear some yeah, of it so and put the prices up a bit. That's right. So it squeezes your margins. You then need to, okay, let's refocus on our business. Our margins are squeezed. We've obviously got to get more efficient. It's a good point you make because um, 
you know, you've gone through COVID. We talked about supply, your margins, you know, your margin is getting eroded in some way. You know, costs have gone up, inflation. But you've also got the fact that interest rates are now going up and people tend to get rid of, you know, the things that aren't a, a, a necessity in their lifestyle. So at what point does does your product not become a necessity to them and do you see that as a risk in, in the near future? And I mean, and that's that's a good question and a bit of an unknown. I mean, I I think in the past, during certain times, I think people do value their health and fitness. And if they see the SUPS as part of their health and fitness, it's probably it probably does survive the, a bit of a you know if they're cutting their personal expenditures. Often they see that as a, a necessary expenditure for a lot of people. Um, and but then the other challenge that you you have to face is that some people can't afford that certain price point. So you need to start looking at, well, okay, let's start manufacturing things at a cheaper price point. Let's, you know, bring down the number of serve, you know, rather than selling things in a, a three kilo bucket, let's bring it out in a, a 900 gram sort of bag. So people can, you know, people can sort of, they're not feeling like that they're handing over that big lump sum of money all the time and they can, you know, I suppose you'd be, be a bit more flexible with how they purchase. It is the joys of running a business where eyes wide open at the start, gung-ho, rip on in, bit of a side gig initially where it was like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my, my uh, you know, uh, Ironman career, I'm having a crack at this, I've got my degree and, and then all of a sudden you go, well, okay, we've now created something that is, you know, sustainable. Now that doesn't change that that focus because if anything, as you say, you could lose it in time if you take your finger off the pulse, or somebody else could come in with a a huge amount of marketing or new products or new ways. So, yeah, there is no opportunity to rest in business, is there? No, really, def- definitely not. And I mean, it's as you say, you sort of you, when you when you first start, you you don't know what you don't know, and I mean, there's still plenty I don't know. But you know, I talked before about my accounting studies, and I think I learnt more in the first six months of being in my own business about accounting than what I learned in 10 years of studying at, at university. And, and it's a bit the same now. As, as you meet all these challenges, you're right. If you just sit there and curl up in the fetal position, no one cares. No yeah, one's going right. to come and give you a pat on the shoulder and say, oh, it'll be all right, mate. You've got to, as I said, you've just got to keep looking for new opportunities. Um, what can we do better to what, what we're doing now? And, and that's really... All you can do, you've got to keep and just work hard. And I, and I think we're sort of, you know, me, me and Simon are still sort of entrenched in the business and we're still working hard and, and, and doing our best. And I, and I suppose that's that's all you can do. You can sort of, as I said, you can convince yourself that it's the end of the world, but that's not going to help you. You've got to just keep every, – everyone's in the same boat, so you've just got to keep um, working away at what you do well, be consistent and – and hopefully you'll get the result in the end. Meanwhile, you've had a family at home the whole time while you and your brother have started this business. Were you good at the balance or you used the word entrenched in the business there, but um, were you good at making sure there was still time at home? I'd, I'd like to think that I have been. I mean, I'm sure, you know, my family might disagree <laughs> at certain times, but, but I think with one of the downsides, as you guys know, one of the downsides of owning your own business is that you feel like you're on call 24 7 and it's always there it's a bit like you know when you're at school and you've got an exam coming up you're down the beach with your mates and you just got in the back of your head i should be home studying i should be home studying and business can be a bit the same whereas you're doing things with your family and you're thinking i've got to deal with that i've got to deal with that and i've got to deal with that and so whereas you've got the downside of that 24 7 i think you've also got to look at the upside as if you really need to do something, you can. So if my kids have got something that I really want to go to. You don't have to ask your boss. That's right. I can go. <laughs> and, and if that means I've got to get up at three that morning and do some work, well. You can. I can. You and, and, if, and if you're prepared to do it. And, and I think that's where you can get caught in that mindset of, oh, I've got to work, I've got to work, I've got to work. But you can also take the time that I haven't missed. You know, I sort of get to my swimming carnivals, get to, you know, as I said, I've just been up the Gold Coast with my daughter while she races and I can combine a bit of work with that. So, I mean, overall, I think I'm very lucky in the, the balance I've had. You talked about combining. Well, I do believe you sponsor the kids 
employ the kids, you know, father the kids. Is that right? I think you've got a couple of employees there. That trip yeah. was very work. Yeah, yeah, as I said, I'm slave child, child slave labour is um, not not against the rules in our, in our household. <laughs> but no, it's sort of it is interesting because when you when you start the business and as you say, it's 20, 20 odd years ago, and and when you're um, now my now my eldest. Now my eldest Ben's working in the business and it is bizarre to sort of um, to think that you've got a child working in the business and, and, and touch wood, he's, he's studying at uni as well and, and working in the business and he, he seems to really enjoy it. I was, I was a bit nervous about it at first. I sort of thought, you know, will, he, will there be – but yeah, touch wood, it's been – The tough conversation, sorry, mate, you've got to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. But we're pretty hard on him and um, – but no, nah, he's been actually really good and he's doing, he's doing a good job and it's, it's good that he wants to – it's a good base, I think, to get in and, you know, any retail if, – if your kid works in retail, that's great experience. They learn to deal with people. They understand the basics of business, cash flow, all, all that sort of stuff. But that – to have that customer service and deal with different types of people is a, a great skill to have for life. And is it is it true you're, you're raising a couple of little champions as well? Is that right? They're, they're following in dad's footsteps? Oh, mate, I'm lucky I've got three happy and healthy kids. They're all um, fit, and, fit and active and, and my middle daughter, she loves the dancing and and, and she's still right into her dancing and she teaches dancing and she's doing year 12 this year. So obviously it's a bit harder for her to do things. Ben, yeah, Ben sort of came through surf life saving. He's not doing a lot of surf life saving now, but he's, you know, he goes to the gym and, and, and that sort of stuff. And my, my younger daughter, she's a, she's a bit of a mad clubby. She's a bit more like a dad. She, she loves the clubbies and yeah, they all, they all go pretty good at what they do, which makes me proud. So what's next? Like really, you've, you've conquered a lot in your personal career. You've conquered a, not, a lot already in business. You know, you seem to be raising a great family. What, what's, what's on the horizon for you? Oh, mate, we just, I, I suppose, and that is one thing in terms of business ad, advice for people. That's, if I sort of look back on our business, that's probably one thing that if I started again, how you structure your business, we probably, it was just, it was this business that just, grew organically and we probably didn't get the right accounting structures and legal structures in place to start with so it can get a bit messy and now we're sort of getting towards the end of our careers it's tricky to tidy it up and and not just that it's one of those jobs that you keep putting on the back burner you sort of think you're, you're busy doing other stuff and you're and so you know we we want to just sort of keep going where we're going we probably need to I suppose we need people keep telling me when I speak to business people they keep telling me I need to think about our exit strategy one day because I suppose where Simon's 55 I'm I'm 50 so you're gonna have to retire one day but I wouldn't mind looking that good at 50 geez there's hey? still um there's still I was waiting for him to say 42 but anyway <laughs> there's still parts of the business you know that we're you know we're really passionate about the business still and and we want to keep as I said, not with the retail, we don't want to sort of have, oh, we want 100 shops. We want to keep opening retail stores. We've got some good partners in our business that we work with. We want to keep growing areas of our business with them. The manufacturing side of the business is always interesting and there's opportunities for things that get manufactured in Australia. The rest of the world seems to like products that come from Australia because they know the, we're using quality ingredients and, and that sort of thing. So there's that, that side of the business. That we're still interested in. Well, it's been a pretty in incredible 21 years. We look forward to seeing what comes over the next 21. Thanks for talking us through a bit of the journey today and thanks for being part of the podcast. No, thanks for having me, guys. I've, I've enjoyed it.